Thank you very much, Alex. And might I say you're doing a fantastic job hosting this. Um, so yes, let's talk about building Neo4j Ops Manager and the lessons we've learned from using all of our internal or um, tools that are available in the Neo4j ecosystem. Um, as you've heard, my name is Sasha. I am a software engineer at Neo. Uh, before I joined the Ops Manager team, I had the privilege of working in the Cypher team as well. Um, and that's all you need to know for right now. So let's talk a bit about Ops Manager or more um, concretely, let me redirect you uh, and remind you there was a really, really good presentation from our product manager, Chris Shelmerdeen, uh, on the first day of notes about Ops Manager that I really recommend you watching. Um, he even showed some things that haven't been released yet, so that's interesting. Um, just to give a short summary, Ops Manager is a new tool for administrators um, that can help you uh, observe the state, the health of or your Neo4j deployment by looking at metrics, for example, or it can do things like give you an upgrade path um, tailor-made for your Neo4j deployment from one Neo4j uh, version to another one. Um, so that's really, really nice and helpful. Um, don't want to go into more detail than that. Let's talk more about dog fooding. And dog fooding, uh, as you might know, basically means that to eat your own uh, or to use your own software. Um, and Neo4j produces a lot of that. And the Neo4j ecosystem produces a lot of software. So like Alex already alluded to, we had the goal of using as much as possible to have more feedback loops there to maybe file the occasional bug or feature request, make our own ecosystems better by doing that. And I can just say um, that was a really good experience and I love doing that. So what do I want to talk about? This is the general architecture of uh, Ops Manager. You can see there's a host instance where your Neo4j is running that you want to monitor and administrate. There's this little NOM agent running on it, a little Go program that sends all the metrics to this NOM server. Um, and that NOM server is also having a little uh, persistence database. That is, of course, it, uh, it is a Neo4j database. And I won't talk about user interface because I'm a backend developer and I know where my limitations are. So let's talk about how to use Neo4j to store metrics. That's the first thing I want to do. And then I also want to talk about how we can take what is inside that persistence and migrate them from di between different data models. That's interesting, right? Then there's a tool called Spring Data Neo4j that makes our life in the NOM server so much easier. And to make it even easier to use Spring Data Neo4j, we also use the Cypher DSL um, that is a still pretty hidden gem. Um, so let's talk about those four things now, starting with how to store or using Neo4j to store metrics. And in the beginning, they said to us, well, Neo4j isn't optimized to store metric data. It's not really a graph, right? And they're right. But we said, well, let's see how far we can take that. Challenge accepted, right? So as you can see here, we have nodes. And they're not really related at all. Every node is like one point for a specific in a specific um, specific value at a specific time. Not related, not really graphy. Let's look at the nodes. Let's look at the first data model that we came up with. You can see here in this little JSON representation that we have labels. Cool. So it's a metric label on all of them. Makes sense. There's an additional label telling you what kind of metric that is. So it's a histogram or Gauge metric or whatever. Um, and then there are certain properties, which gnome agent is that thing coming from? Which instant was that on? Obviously the name, the value, so additional labels, the timestamp, really important. Um, pretty solid thing, the thing you would come up um, as a first level data model, right? Um, you can see some of them are a bit repetitive. If you scale it up to like millions of nodes, you will have loads of nodes with like the same instance ID, right? might be something you can optimize there. Um, the real problem is obviously this grows indefinitely. 
So just pump it, pumping out new metrics like this means that, yeah, you will run out of storage space at some point. Um, so you have to optimize for that a bit. Um, and you have to just clean up old metric data at some point or roll them into uh, aggregated ones. So we thought maybe we can improve this. And we did. We just recently worked on improving this. We still have one data point, uh, one node per data point. But you can see now um, we changed around the labels and properties. Um, the timestamp is now an integer, which doesn't look like it saves much. It actually does. And you scale it up to millions of nodes. Um, but the most interesting thing is obviously that we now use agent and name inside the labels instead of properties. Why do we do that? Well, if we have the name property, uh, the name as a property on every node, we have one proper property record on every node. If we instead use a label, we can say we can just have a little reference on that node. It's probably an integer or something like that. Um, instead of that string property, which is really, really uh, much more tiny. So we actually save just by having this label reference here um, on that node, uh, on the node. And we also get, a rid get rid of a few things. For example, if you see here, there's this label thing. It's basically empty. Um, why save it, right? And doing all of those things netted us, well, over half, um, an improvement of uh, basically half the storage size. So that's pretty neat, right? Um, so you can see you can store metrics in Neo4j. Pretty cool. But damn, I just now uh, ch fundamentally changed the data model. So I need to write a program for the next time that will start, that will like knows how the old model works and translate that into the new model. No, I don't have to do that because I use Neo4j migrations which um, our colleague Michael Simmons already gave a really good talk about. So I don't want to repeat that. I just want to give you some examples here. Um, but you can do schema migrations and refactoring super, super easy. And there is a module for Spring Boot, which handily fits into our architecture. So let's just have some examples. And the first one, a Cypher-based migration. You put in some Cypher scripts, you execute them. It's it's done. You can do some index changes, so set up schema. You can actually set up data as well, which is super helpful if you do um, tests. You can pre-populate your te uh, test databases with that, for example. Really, really great. Um, there are catalog-based migrations, which is basically you can set up schema without the need to remember all the cipher syntax. Um, really handy. Um, and there's something I really, really love. There are uh, certain refactorings in there that are um, for you to take. And this one is my personal favorite because it actually um, creates the new form of um, database indexes that come with uh, Neo4j 5 um, automatically for you. So if you haven't done that yet on your Neo4j 4, um, just running this, creates them automatically. And if you then move your Neo4j into a, a, to Neo4j 5.1, for example, um, the, uh, the migration will automatically kill your old indexes. So just running this once um, helps you immensely just migrating your um, database to Neo4j 5. That's great, right? And then there are Java-based migrations. Just a simple Java class, and through that context, um, you can just get to the uh, and a driver running underneath and then do all the things you want to do with that driver. For example, I'm uh, running a call in transactions query here, which I actually can't do on the other um, uh, Cypher-based and catalog-based migrations yet because as of today, um, Michael sent me a link of a commit where he made also that possible. So um, there's a tight feedback loop going on here. And I thank you a lot, Michael. Um, let's talk about Spring Data near 4 j So we're on the server now. And we obviously need some kind of graph to object mapping, right? 
why do why should we build that ourselves? So what we do, we use Spring Data Nail for J or SDN, and it gives us reactive programming. There's um, a really really nice Spring Boot integration, and I will stress this one: there are no surprises. It's it's really what you expect. You have a Java class representing a metric, and you just have this annotation, which will translate to a label. Um, you have some internal ID. I don't care about that. I don't need to care about that. And then I just fill in some properties. And then when I want to create one of those, well, there's this reactive near for template. I can just create this metric um, like I would any other Java object and save that to the template and I'm good to go. And the same way I can just retrieve it. I can take the template, say, uh, say find by ID and get that very uh, data point back. Obviously, you don't want to do that with metrics, ask for like a certain ID, right? So you can also have repositories um, and uh, run cipher queries on them and then put them into specified methods. You don't have to read all of that, um, but you can just do that. You can also do that, uh, just run Cypher queries on the reactive Neo4j template as well, if you like. Um, but to run Cypher queries, you saw that was a string. And strings, Cypher and strings, yeah, yeah, sure, I can do that. But if I generate those things, it gets complicated. I need to do string concatenations, and no one wants to do that, and it will fail. And if the syntax changes, that will fail as well, and I need to go in and change strings, and everyone hates that, right? So that is where the Cypher DSL comes in, because this one uses a builder approach and is actually type safe. So my whole code gets checked at compile time to see if it actually still works. And it only generates valid Cypher constructs. That means that if the syntax changes and I just update the dependency, it will just do the new kind of query. I don't need to go in to change the strings. It's neat, right? So I have an example. Uh, we have this uh, query where I just ask for any metrics between a, a certain start and end time and order by a timestamp, obviously. And this is how it would look like. It looks longer, obviously, but it's still the same thing. You still have the query here where you have the match on a metric, um, on, on, a met on this metric variable, which is basically just a node with a label metric named M. And I can reference that, for example, in the order by clause by saying, I want to order by this metric um, this timestamp. And then I can have some where clause, which is basically the same thing as the other one. And that's that. I run the same thing on the repository or the reactive near 4 j template. And I'm good to go. And that's the very quick uh, run through um, some of the tools that we've used, the dog fooding that we did. Uh, just to recap, data modeling is really, really fun in a graph, even if you don't have relationships. Um, Neo4j can definitely be used to store metrics, even though it's not optimized for it. But if you have a good index uh, um, strategy, right, it's totally possible. Dog fooding itself is like a great source of feedback for finding bugs uh, and making new friends. <laughs> Um, and the Neo4j ecosystem is really, really rich and really helpful. Like I showed you three things. We obviously also use the Neo4j drivers, um, the Prometheus endpoint in Neo4j itself to monitor the Neo4j de uh, deployment. We use Neo4j Aura um, for hosting our test databases in the cloud. And there's so much more in there that we didn't use yet. Um, and I'm looking forward to using more of those things. Special thanks to Michael Simmons and Garrett because they produced all of those free, wonderful uh, things, uh, tools and frameworks and libraries. Um, and they're really quick when you have like a feature question or like um, want something improved. And please, please try them all out. 
especially ops manager, because we love to hear about uh, your experiences. We love to have some feedback uh, from you. So I hope to hear from you and thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, chat, you know what to do. Uh, I, I don't have to tell you, I hope. Yes, here we go. I remember now. <laughs> um, one uh, question, there's time for one question, I think, from John. Um, how large have you seen the NOM database get number of nodes and size? Do you remember this? Ah, good question. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen any customer databases yet, so that's... I can't say you how it looks like in like the real world, and we're doing a lot of experimentation on how like how much we can fit in there, what's feasible. Um, so I can't really answer that because the things we try out is probably more than the real world will see. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, there's some documentation um, how to spec your GNOME server or. Um, the database that uh, that goes with it, and right. maybe my colleagues can help me out as well. Yeah, no worries. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Sasha, um, for this presentation.